Hi, so we are back with our panel with Cristina Vega, uh, Luis Sepri, uh, Cristina Hagelin, and Perina Torberina. Uh, and I'm just going to hand it over already. So welcome them on stage. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you already uh, met uh, these three wonderful producers, and uh, I work with them. I also have a, a, a history as a producer. I started my background is programming, so actually I started as a programmer. Don't ask me how one thing led to the other. I was asked to be a lead, then I was asked to be a manager, then I don't know what happened, and I became a director, and then this, and then that. And then here I am. I'm uh, working uh, as executive producer uh, at IO of the team that uh, Luise and Perina work, uh, Backbone. Basically, we develop our power engine, and there are other services. And, uh, um, yeah. and then today we decided to put together this agenda. First, uh, showing you a bit the skills and the difference between uh, us four, I guess. And then now we want to talk a bit uh, more like the experiences. And then uh, I guess you have questions from before, and maybe this will spark also a conversation. So we wanted to use the time this, and at the end have questions for the whole thing, both for the panel and the, um, and the, and the presentation. So um, we get right into it. And then the, to get started, um, I prepare some questions. And uh, maybe we could start with like, um, what do you think is the most fun of it all in your daily basis? For me, um, what I mentioned earlier also is, is, uh, is the fast-paced environment. It's, um, it's the the international uh, atmosphere that you work in. It's, um, it's, uh, it's the creativity that you're around and, um, and it's working with other smart people and making great solutions together. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's that kind of collaboration I find very thrilling, actually. <laughs> what about now? Yay. Uh, I would actually also say um, giving the team some, some clear strides and next steps and, and watching them just sprint for it and achieving it is, uh, is what I find is most fun. Also because they are actually super grateful for it. It's not like they just go and forget about you. They are like, thank you for this work. I could not achieve this. Uh, so that is uh, what's most fulfilling for me. Uh, very similar to Luisa's answer. Uh, there, there are many things that I really, really like about gaming industry, but working with these amazing people, I've never seen it in uh, anywhere else. Like, it's not uh, like I have 100 years and I worked in every industry in the world, but everyone are welcoming, they're ready to help each other, and it's just the, this opportunity to work on a on a piece of art slash software. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it is really something that I enjoy the most, uh, being part of that. It's, it's a passion project in many ways, for also for all involved, which is super inspiring. Yeah. yeah. That was the good times. But what about the bad times? I mean, like, uh, at least me, there are days that I'm pulling my hair. Uh, which are those days for you? Like what uh, makes you think like, damn. <laughs> when Backbone breaks the game. Right? Nah. Oh, sign off. <laughs> Not again. That <laughs> one. <laughs> That's, uh, it's stressful when you have a room feel like you've finally managed to get all the stakeholders and it's all the bottlenecks in the company that needs to be in one room at the same time. It's impossible to schedule. You got it. And then the game is not working. And it's... It's horrible <laughs> because it all falls back on the producer. Like, why is it not? <laughs> and then you're <laughs> like, sorry, no, we have a backup. <laughs> yeah, um, that that those days are hard. <laughs> yeah, I also think that the the balancing of the needs of the team and then balancing that with the needs of the project can be a really tough one. Like, if you see your programmers or team being, you know. Um, yeah, down on some direction that, that we need to take because it, it's, a, it's a company goal, uh, for instance, um, kind of mitigating or, or yeah, uh, mediating, being in, in, in a mediating role, but also 
kind of yeah um, showing the way and getting people on board is um, that that can be challenging and um, yeah sometimes being also maybe the messenger of something that that is going to be unpopular <laughs> can be difficult. Yeah, uh, I I think uh, what's what's really tough for me it's is also related to the fact that I'm an associate producer, so uh, my, my utility belt is still missing some, uh, some skills, or they're still at least not as uh, enhanced. So uh, I struggle with the part where I'm supposed to be okay with not knowing stuff and then not having the answer straight away. Uh, and I you, you feel like you want to support your team, programmers, artists, your stakeholders, like you, you want to be there to assist them, but there's some blockages or there's some parts that you just don't understand and, it, and you need time to understand it, to, to help your colleagues in the future even faster. Yeah, you mentioned actually now that uh, the, some of the parts that are hard is this mediating and maybe saying some news. And I also experience some stuff like that. Sometimes I need to take the company side. We need to go there. I know this is going to be unpopular. And also, we don't produce things. Like the people produce things. We need to lead them, and we need them to want to do something. And sometimes we know it's something unpopular. We even think it's unpopular. But we still need to, um, to go for this company goal, try to move, create this movement there. What are your coping mechanisms or how you make that happen when you feel like a the team needs to go there and maybe you they are not so on board or you feel it's going to be some resistance. Provide context as to why this is important. Uh, also think linked to speak true. So it's not modeled why we do this, why we make this decision, uh, but provide some clarity. What do you think? I totally agree. <laughs> That's a good said. one. <laughs> Plus one. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it's it's um, there's also some practicing of having these uh, difficult conversations with people sometimes, and uh, what what is um, yeah putting things into context and and also um, making yeah. Oh, communicate, having a dialogue, and how how can this how is this creating value for the team, not just not just the company, but also for the team and and um, and and vice versa. Um, yeah, yeah, goals. Um, some of you, I mean, some of you have been uh, producing for long. Some of you started recently. But uh, if you think at the early uh, stages, I think a lot of people listening today might be considering being a producer. So maybe there is an idea of uh, what these people do. Hopefully, we have demystified some of it. But uh, the, then we are actually doing it. Uh, when you think about when you, st when you were about to start and now, is there anything that really didn't meet, meet your expectations? You thought the job was about A and actually it's about B. I mean, some part that is actually like, I didn't think I was going to be doing that. Is there any of that? I think maybe one of the things that have surprised me is that that there is a lot of people management in the job. I mean, as you said, we're not we're not robots and we're not working with robots either. There's a lot of um, tuning in, um, establishing relationships, um, and uh, and you need to to uh, connect with people and 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 get to know them to find out what motivates them, uh, how to collaborate, how to. Um, create fellowship, um, so it's not just project management, it's very much also people management. I would, I would second that. Uh, there was a lot more to that than, uh, than I originally anticipated. Um, yeah. <laughs> people. <laughs> people. <laughs> no, people. But that's also what makes it fun because if it was only project management, I don't think it would be for me either. Mm. Um, it's a good balance. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to just add that um, I have not expected that it will be this dynamic. 
I, I knew that, and I even work at tech department. I don't work directly on a game. But in tech department, there's, there's always something happening. There's, like every month, there's a new initiative of how this whole system should be improved because there's a GDC talk on how someone else did it. And then we put uh, our smartest guys in, and girls in the same room, and it's like, okay, you figure it out. But, but we have these huge initiatives all the time happening. It's not like we can put a stop on anything that we're working on. It's always going to be work in progress. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Actually, we always have something. Like, we, ne we, we will never be done. No. no I think that's it. Also, another point. Uh, today, a lot of people uh, participating uh, are uh, non-sense gender males. And uh, um, we are four of those. And uh, usually, the, the, um, the game industry is uh, seen as a very male-dominated uh, industry. There are a lot of uh, dudes around us. Um, how do you feel? Because, I mean, a lot of times you lead uh, teams that are not uh, equal to you or similar in those regards, gender-wise, also skill-wise, and in, uh, like in many aspects. How do you feel it's like not being a non-gender male in game industry and in producing? How do you feel about that? That was a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in on missions on Project 007, I, I'm the only female producer. I'm also the only one with kids, and I feel that I'm not as flexible as the others with my time. Uh, and of course, this leads to some tough talks and some personal hits sometimes, um, which is, uh, in general, I think something should be improved on uh, the mm -hmm. view because you also bring a lot to the table by being a minority. Uh, different perspectives which are valued. Um, and I think it's all depending on which constellation you end up in, but sometimes y you really feel like you bring something that the rest does not, and it's appreciated. And other times it, it's being taken for granted. I think it's all about constellations there. Hmm? I mostly had good experience. Uh, I had a lot of doubts and even even a, a little bit of fear uh, because, again, I'm not coming from technical background and I'm working with technical people and they're all dudes. Uh, and I don't know them and how is it going to work. Um, I think I was also lucky that I came to the company which, which had a strong women also leading their teams. So that helped me a lot. And I felt that in 99% of cases, I really had uh, my colleagues, other dudes, support, really. And uh, I, I think that's super important. There are, of course, some issues and troubles uh, that, that needs identifying and then working on. But I think that we're getting there and that we're getting better uh, at those. Yeah, I, I feel that um, actually the diversity that we bring is very appreciated and valued, at least at IO. And um, personally, I I I uh, don't mind uh, there being a work or working with a ma the majority of of working in a majority of men. Uh, but um, I feel that we are giving given a lot of um, ownership if if we want that at IO and 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 that it's recognized that we bring also something else we bring a diversity and and something else of value um, so it's a strength I feel yeah I agree yeah <laughs> <laughs> also, I think like at IO in particular I think we're doing uh, quite well compared to other uh, studios or industry I think in leadership roles production. Uh, there is a quite a fair bit, but yeah, I mean, like the big chunk. And I think little by little, we're providing some uh, some new angles and the, yeah. like the wheels are turning. Yeah. So hopefully many of you will choose producing or some specialist yeah. uh, role uh, in games, but yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything uh, you would like to add or should we see if uh, some of the attendees have some questions? Question. Questions? Have, 
any questions, I can just give you the microphone. Hi, I wanted to follow up a bit uh, on the last uh, topic you were bringing about being women. Um, so, I mean, historically, it's a male-dominated field. And how do you feel, for example, uh, being a mother um, when you, you, know, you have other priorities in your life and some people or some colleagues don't and then they can work until, you know, 8 or 10 when there's a sprint or something and you can't. And how can you, you know, ha the conflict of, you know, wanting to maybe put all your effort or, you know, being there for your team, but also, you know, you know that you can't be there and you prioritize other things in your life too. You know, this, this work-life balance um, seems very hard, especially for women, but also, I mean, and it should, it should be just as important for men that have families too. Or, um, yeah, so I, f I find this very hard, especially uh, in production. I feel like kind of it's sometimes expected more you is, is expected sometimes. And yeah, it's very intense. It's a very intense job. That's the impression I get of it. Um, I'm going to take this because I'm <laughs> I have kids. <laughs> uh, it, it is. Uh, but I also think when you have kids, it's a no-brainer that they come first. They do. Um, I'm also in a special situation because my husband works at I.O. as well. Uh, so we often have to prioritize when one kid is sick, who has the most important meetings today? <laughs> what is most beneficial for the company? Often I win because I'm a producer and he's an animator. <laughs> so, uh, but I think there is value in production going home, not too late, because it will give the, the developers time to work instead of getting poked about when it's is things done. Uh, it creates a calm space for them um, to actually get things done because there's a lot of meeting throughout the day, usually run by producers. Uh, so I don't feel guilty about leaving to pick up my kids. Uh, I will get back to them if there are questions. They will chat with me and I will write them back or take a call if needed. Um, but I do. I get up earlier than any of them. So I put in my hours in the morning instead instead of uh, evening. Um, so I think that part I have come to terms with. I think it's also within yourself to uh, to come to terms that, that there's work and then there's life. And then you have your work to support your life. And I also think it's important to communicate that to the team that I do not expect them to sit at night. I prefer they don't. I prefer they go home and relax and meet up the next day refreshed. Uh, because we're going to do this for a while. So we can't burn our candle in both ends. The, the, I'm a mom too, and I also commute from Malmo and Copenhagen. And the, um, of course, as a producer, we have this mental border of being, burden of being the agenda. And also as a mother, usually in the household, we also have that, so our heads spin. And that it doesn't stop, it keeps on spinning, right? But uh, when it comes to... Uh, to picking kids, for example, I leave quite early and then I make the hours at some other time. And that's fine. That's something that we have agreed with the company. Also, Ayo is not a big studio, but it's not a, also like a startup. So we can have agreements with those around us, like, look, I'm going to leave and that's it. We don't, we don't do crunch in, at Ayo. We don't think, uh, like as she mentioned, it's not about sprinting. This is a marathon. And the one that wins is the one that can keep the pace, a continuous pace during like the, our productions, what are three, four years. So it has to be like a, a workable thing. And then, uh, um, so then that makes it possible, the work-life balance also. The, game comp the games companies, once upon a time, everyone was young. And everyone that is young is willing to work million hours. But that people that was young then, now is us that have kids. And all of us have kids. Not all of us, but many. So a lot of people is seeking this work-life balance, I think. Mm. It's getting better, I would say, with time. So it's... it's is doable. Over mm. the last few years, I feel a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. But even though you don't have kids, I feel like it's also important to, yeah. to uh, remember the work-life balance. Um, can you, should you work until 10 in the evening um, if you've got to work at 8? <laughs> exactly. Do we have more questions? Uh, we have a question online. Yeah. 
If you don't have a, um, either education or background in, in, in game production or computer science, then I think actually project management is a good place to start. I mean, working on a lot of different um, projects, uh, working with timelines, working with a lot of different people. Um, yeah, even events, I mean, some kind of production, yeah. I did that, that journey because I was a programmer. And then it was offered to me to be a lead. And then I was a lead of a team. And then it, it, it started happening. And then when I started working in a company called the... It was in Unity? I don't know if I remember if it was Unity or Square Enix. But it doesn't matter. But uh, the, um, they offered me to go to a course that it was from a specialist to manager. Because a specialist, you are doing something. You have a thing that you produce. But as a manager, you produce through others. So then there is a lot, like uh, as uh, she said, the uh, project management. I remember um, I didn't know what to do. I knew minus 10 in project management. And back then, Agile was starting to be a thing. So I became a Scrum Master. So then I was practicing those things that I learned in that course because I thought it was cool. And then in this uh, course that I went from a specialist to manager, actually, they, they taught me a lot about people how to manage people, have hard conversations, a bit how to profile people. What Luis talked before in the presentation, you motivate people differently. Some people want to be alone, some people want to own stuff, and they teach you some of those tricks. Because as a specialist, you will always want to deliver something, and we don't deliver. We, we make others deliver. And that is, a, that is a big change. So I think, and there are many resources online, but I'm sure that uh, Google in specialist to manager and then some hardcore project management skills, or at least that's the journey that helped me a bit back then. I, I believe it's also important to emphasize that all the skills you can learn once you decide, okay, I can see myself in this role. Because I believe that people come from QA, like, they, they were testers and some, somehow ended uh, in, in production because they got a better overview of how game, games work. And then on the, law, uh, on the way, they also figured it out that they're, they have these skills of jack of all trades, master of none, uh, 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 person that's capable of adjusting and uh, learning a lot of different things, maybe not in depth, but still being someone that can um, uh, oversee a group of people uh, and uh, and be a team leader. So it can be someone that 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 that's an artist, but figured it out. Okay, I have the skills that that are needed for for being producer, and then uh, working her way towards it. Yeah, I want to second that. Uh, starting out as something else in a game studio uh, was also my entryway into this and, and gave me a foundation, foundational understanding of how to make games, which was super, super valuable. Uh, the rest of the skills you can more or less learn. Uh, they should also somewhat be embedded in you that you have empathy and you can read the room and have conversations with people, also tough ones, and, and manage a project. But if you are disciplined and keeping good overview, I think you, you have what it takes within you to become a producer and then starting out in a different role, getting to know your basis first is, is a good way. The, on that note, there was one of the directors at IO, like the, the, when you are a director, is one of the technical directors, it's a very leadership and you also get to manage staff, we're doing this, we're doing that, has a lot of priorities and it's something that is very paired with a producer. They don't, usually technical directors don't code, they organize stuff as well with the technical head, right? We are more enabling. But uh, he is, is a bit hectic and then he was telling me, next job I'm getting to be a specialist and I'm going to be coding, you know, like, I'm not doing this. And then I told him, that's impossible because his personality, then he will be promoted to lead in two yeah, weeks. Exactly. <laughs> because it's how he is. It's like there is people that are meant to be, like don't, no matter which group they are, they have the skills, the empathy. They are the kind of person that when there is a problem wants to help and is service-minded and organized. I mean, and of course we formalize those skills, I think. But some people, yeah, this guy is going to become the lead in whatever group you put him because that's what he... Is his nature, and I think a bit of that it also happens with the producers. Yeah. It's very like uh, you have to have that 
some certain traits, I yeah. guess. Yeah. OCD. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, just joining to that question, because I think during these two days, during the talks, uh, people mentioned networking and events. Uh, and maybe if you could uh, say some, like what kind of events are these? Because I think you mentioned events in general, but if you could mention a specific type of events that maybe you've been to uh, and it was interesting from, I don't know, from game jams to, to industry events. I don't get out a lot with three small <laughs> kids. <laughs> My oldest is six, so <laughs> uh, I think the most recent one I went to was Women in Games, which was nice to talk to people who are in a similar situation, uh, <laughs> but it was not production oriented. Yeah, I'm just reminded uh, that there is something called Danish Producers Association, yeah. Yeah. and they do have uh, producer events uh, coming up. Actually, Anne, who spoke uh, before lunch uh, from Saipo, uh, I went to an event at Saipo, we went together, yeah. um, meeting other producers and um, hearing talks about game production at Saipo, basically. Um, so that's a good place maybe to also connect with people, and learn find more. find them on Discord. Yeah, Discord. Um, that's where they announce events. Also, today we're being here hosted by the Game Habitat. And the Game Habitat is, uh, yeah, this building is like the house, the home of them, but they are actually like uh, connecting a lot of uh, game studios. And they also organize a lot of events. For example, tomorrow they have like this uh, barbecue, and they usually is like a lot of people, like 100 or 200 developers. And of course, it's people in the game industry, and there are producers. And then in general, I think, Producers, we are like uh, in the game industry, but it's something that exists pretty much in every company nowadays. So there are a lot of uh, leadership conferences and meetups. And nowadays there are like so many women in tech, women in uh, something like the, a lot of uh, groups. And now, yeah, and I think it's just good to networking. Like uh, it's very enriching to learn from people, not only like um, game producers, I think. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Yes, another online. Definitely, uh, yeah. So I always try to see if I can solve conflicts uh, first myself, just get an idea about what is the root of this. And if I feel like this is outside of my boundaries, I immediately leave it to the people managers at IO, who will then take it and facilitate something. Um, but I, it often blurs. And sometimes it escalates if, if you're not successful in your first uh, encounter with it. Mm. So, so figuring out when to hand it over is, is also something you need to train uh, your skill in. All right. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to to say that um, uh, as a as a producer, you might sometimes want to help and go even uh, beyond your role as a producer, but it can happen that you just cannot do that work and you cannot you know, get some people together to really have a dialogue. It's sometimes you just have a situation, as you said, where you have to let it go because um, uh, you cannot make effort instead of people. Like as much as you want to bring people together and you, 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 won't, uh, you, you want to have a, a, a constructive dialogue, it, there are situations where, where, where it's not impossible and that's where you know, we, we luckily have people managers taking care of situations like that and HR, so... Um, also because you're very close to the team, uh, so yeah. you have to be mindful of that, that you work with them on a daily basis. Uh, and sometimes some of these conversations has to be facilitated with someone who is not close to that person. Yeah. But there could also be smaller things like 
yeah, where you actually have have to be the face of HR sometimes, like uh, people coming in late, uh, later than our core hours are, um, for instance, um, where you need to have a direct conversation with the person. Um, you don't leave that to HR. You need to. That's on you. <laughs> yeah, at IU, I think like we are of a certain size, so we have uh, the production role, but we also have uh, what uh, they mentioned, a people manager. And the people man and then we have a chart like the traditional HR. The people manager they deal with these conflicts that surpass us. We are not experts, we are not coaches, we are we are we are we have to hit milestones like at the core and make it in a with, with the people coming along efficiently and in a nice way. That's our quest, right? But uh, uh, then the people also wants to develop. Maybe they want to become something else, or they want to become more senior, or they have conflicts. People change teams. We are we are not always with the same team. For example, as, uh, as Christine mentioned, she has the core team, but she also has supporting teams. And maybe she has someone for two months, and then they go, and then they come back. Then when there is a conflict, is this person doing well? Is this person doing bad? We had change people and change producer who owns it. So we have these people managers that are constant. They don't move from project to project. So often they are the person that have this continuum in the person and are the ones that they take care of. So in that regard, yes, sometimes we are the first person that we go and say, hey, you're not performing or you're coming late or you're this. They accept it, they do it well, and they rectify, that's it, problem solved. But if the problem escalates, uh, in our case at IO, we don't deal with it. Like, uh, I mean, we are apart, we are an input, we will go to the people manager and say, hey, we try to talk, we try to do this, this is happening, and they will listen to us, but ultimately, the people well being is on the people manager. We hit milestones, they make sure people is well. And then we cooperate, right? Because we, we don't hit the milestones without the people. But uh, the, yeah, I think uh, we have it easy or easier than maybe other producers in other companies, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Or I like to think so. <laughs> um, you were, oh, yes, uh, you were kind of talking about it earlier uh, when you said as a producer, you're constantly uh, dealing with people who have a lot of expertise in like different sectors um, that you don't necessarily know a lot about. And I was wondering, how do you deal with that? Because to me, it seems like it seems like a, an imposter syndrome, like nightmare. <laughs> and it's kind of like the thing that is that I feel like is the barrier for me to get into, like get interested in, in becoming a producer or in the role. I don't know if, if is there a way that you right um I think when yeah when so when I started I did not come from a technical background and 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 so I felt like I had to focus on my strengths, rather. Uh, I came from a project management background, having worked with a lot of different people. Um, I had to establish relationships and, uh, and processes and um, create an impact uh, to also create credibility with my team. Um, I found that I didn't have to be uh, the same as my team. I could be me, um, focusing on my strengths, and that I didn't have to know everything. Uh, I wasn't the expert. My team are the experts. They're the specialists. Um, but I, and and I'm I'm a, maybe a specialist in my own area, um, which is yeah, producing and and coordinating and project managing. Um, so so sure, and there's a there's some self acceptance <laughs> in it. But if uh, if somebody gives you the chance uh, uh, and you're willing to take it, it's about uh, just diving into it and focusing on your strengths um, and and just learning by doing. Like yeah, and maybe also. A Admitting to your shortcomings, I mean, you don't know everything, and how could you? Um, so, but if people see you charging ahead, then I mean, I, I, I'd like to share one of the best pieces of advice that I got, and it's very much related to to this topic. My my first three months at IO, 
I was thinking the same thing, like this imposter syndrome. It was just not going anywhere. Uh, you get the chance, someone tells you that you can do it, but still you're very hard on yourself. And it's this feeling that you want to give something to the team, to the company. And you cannot clearly see it because they all have JIRA tickets assigned to them and their tasks. And yours is what? Like, what is my job? And then we had this amazing people manager, Hector. If he ever sees this, like, hello to Hector. He's the best. Uh, I came to him with this, uh, with this struggle of mine. And he told me, OK, so we have the same situation. We have this imposter syndrome. If you just take the different stance of how you're looking at the things. So whenever this voice in your head says that something is hard, that you're not good at it, that uh, you know, you're not doing your job, just look at it from the perspective of someone who is curious. So if you th see at the thing that you don't know, that you're not sure if you can do it, just think about it, okay, I'm here to find out what is the answer to this question and how can I be better because I ultimately can do it. And then that's just like, a, a, a sounds like a simple shift that you have to do in your, in your mind, but to me, it helped a lot. For, for me, honestly, it was a game changer. And don't assume that just because you have worked in the industry for a long time, you get rid of imposter syndrome. It comes back on a regular basis and you have to deal with it. I think it's something that everyone struggles with if they are diligent and want to do a good job. And it's not because you're wrong. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentations today. Um, I was wondering if in maybe in IO and in general in the industry, if there's this product owner role that we usually see in Agile and Scrum. Um, because from what I've heard, you also talked about planning and prioritizing and assigning the tasks. And from what I know, this is more of a product owner role and I see some overlaps here and I'm not sure where does the producer's role end and where does the product owner begin then? We don't really have product owners. I think that is the producer. Yeah. <laughs> the producer, I mean, in the case of a uh, backbone, it could be like we have a stakeholder with one feature. So then I think like the lead, the producer, and the, and the stakeholder, they make a product owner somehow. So I think the, yeah. I think for missions, like uh, the producer is the only one there from start to finish, which essentially makes you the product owner. So in a way that would also involve some sort of technical skills as well to understand what technical or understanding what your team does so you know how to best assign the, yeah. the, the tasks. Yeah. Okay. And then the second question, you mentioned how some people need different motivation within the team. And you also mentioned that maybe some of them want to see that what they do brings value. And I was wondering how do you make sure that the work they create is acknowledged and creates value in the project? Right, so so um, once we've kicked off some feature work, uh, we'll usually we'll have like maybe weekly or bi-weekly check-ins with the projects, and um, and one way to get that acknowledgement that your work is creating value is to get the feedback from the project. So the artists and the designers that you're creating, the the users basically that you're creating the feature for, they give you feedback, and um, and that. Uh, like that's one way of um, make, having this sense of re uh, reward or like uh, acknowledgement. We also have a chat, uh, the one which is not a meeting that everyone always starts anyway, <laughs> um, but where you can post things you're working on. Mm -hmm. So the whole studio can see it, or at least the project mm -hmm. uh, on night. And we also have a meeting where people can present. Uh, a weekly one where people can say, I'm ready to show this and they will get some acknowledgement that way. Show and tell. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but there is, there is. I mean, different people need different things. This is so more like uh, one of the managements one on one. Some people wants to learn more and become a better specialist. Some people wants to move up the ladder. Some people wants to move sideways. I'm tired of doing this. I want to do something else. And then. Um, Sometimes an acknowledgement to someone could be like someone that wants to be to move up, for example, 
could be to give more ownership or something. Like instead of doing this task, you can do this thing and maybe with these people around you. So they feel like they are rewarded and they're going to lead others around them. And maybe that helps develop some skills or the specialist. Then you get time to do a course or you get time to do this. So it's, um, of course, the thing of visibility, but they, we have very shy people also in video games. They don't want to, like, their acknowledging is maybe a reward that they get. Then they, they feel seen because this thing that I'm putting effort is, is getting the feedback of getting something that I really want. And that they, they, there is like all these personality tests, like the my breed thingy and, uh, and whereas I don't, I personally don't believe those tests are really right. Uh, I do believe that they, as producers, we need to know our people. There is a component to know what you're dealing with and who and what that person wants and what that person is good at and is bad at and they, they want to try something in another department. So then maybe you give them the task that is more out towards there. Meanwhile, someone that wants something else will hate that. So the, that acknowledgement, someone's telling like, I know that you want to do this, then try this. I give you this. Uh, so I think it has something to do with that too. How we, the reward they get. Sometimes it's by the work they do and how they feel impactful. Then maybe if you, you mentioned uh, you are uh, not using these uh, personality tools, uh, so how do you map uh, the different um, ways of motivating your team members? That's making, sitting down and reflecting. <laughs> I think uh, maybe it'll come to you in, in moments also, oh, or in your one-on-ones, I mean, with people, uh, simply asking them directly uh, what, what, uh, what motivates you, what, what excites you about your work, uh, you know, what would you like to do more of, what could be a personal goal for you, and then you get to know people, um, and you can make a plan together. Um, so dialogue <laughs> could also be a way, or, or a place to start. Uh, I collaborate closely with the leads of the crafts, usually in my core team, to ensure that we have the, the right profiles within that craft assigned uh, on the right things in the mission. And also, if they have some motivations they want to do, and uh, they might want to go from intermediate to senior, then they need to onboard someone. So we get a new intern, okay, they get assigned there, so they get the chance. We plan that out, make it possible. Um, that's one way of going about it. We, we also mentioned situational leadership, and I think uh, there's a lot of uh, useful practices and mappings that you can find. I, I don't know who are the writers at the moment, but if you write situational leadership, you will uh, you'll, uh, should be able to find it. They have a, a mapping for placing each person uh, into categories. Of course, it's not 100% um, uh, reliable, but just to see where the person is in their career development, seniority, how they approach tasks. Um, and then that helps you to, to adjust your leadership style, but also adjust how you manage th 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 these people or how, how you best support them. Uh, so look into that if, if you're even interested in this topic. Great, thank you. Um, more questions from the audience? Yeah? Um, well, I guess it, this is for me specifically, but um, I studied a similar thing in my bachelor's as you, Luis. Uh, yeah, and I was thinking, uh, yeah, how do you make the jump towards production, like, in, in practice, like, what was your first role or something like that? Um, and also, uh, I, I'm currently working as a community manager, and I'm wondering if that could also be a starting point towards a producer role.
So sometimes I think when you look when you look at what's ahead, it's hard to see <laughs> how am I ever gonna make it there. And but and then when you look in the in the rearview mirror, it's kind of like yeah, but one thing led to the other. So that's that's the red thread. That's how it happened. Muted? Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so no, okay. just I was muted. Everything. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I guess the audience uh, present heard me, uh, but maybe not online. Um, but yeah, um, project management is not uh, a bad place to start, and community management is, is not a bad thing to master either um, when going into production. I'd say anything production related doesn't have to be within gaming, could be a path to gaming. In games, there is always this thing about um, most of the job ads says like 25 years of game experience, and then junior people are like, how on earth I'm going to have, I mean, like, and then it's like a loop, it's like we are always like the same people working everywhere. But uh, the, as uh, Luis said, follow the red thread via yes person, maybe you get there, like, and then uh, also like networking is important. Because eventually, maybe a company will need a, a game company will need a community manager, and once you're there, they see that you're a resolute person with this personality, and maybe there you get your first uh, project coordinator. And yeah, I think it's like the the first one is the heart to get into the industry. It's very close, and everybody asks for this amount of years that is quite impossible to have, but the people get in. So like the yeah. Keep on trying because it happens. <laughs> um, in what ways, if there are any, would you like to see the industry change so that more women are empowered to be a part of it? If there are any, or yeah, what's good already, maybe? I think it would be great if we would have more women just applying for a job. So there's this thing where women have have to tick off all the boxes that are put in the job ad. No, don't do it. You don't have to tick off all the boxes. If you have half, apply. If you think that there are some transferable skills, if you think that you have something to offer, go for it either way. That, I mean, that that's the only way how we're going to get more women into this industry. And I guess events like this, so... Uh, uh, so we can repeat on this. I agree there. Um, I often miss f female candidates when we look uh, for new people. There are not many, and of course we have to pick the best candidate, but we can only do so uh, by, by looking at everyone. I would love to have more female options. Um, I think women tend to be a lot harder on themselves uh, than men. Uh, so if they could overcome that and just get that application sent, uh, it would be a huge step in the right direction. Here, here. Yes. Yeah. And lately I've been hooked up, it's not only about women. We need to get more diversity in general. There's not enough people that is not white. There's not enough people with function. I mean, it's like... Traditionally, it was like women and men. It was like the binary wall. But in the recent years, uh, like where we live in a global thing, like people is very homogeneous. You're a Danish company, likely you have Danish. Likely everyone is white. But uh, the, with the uh, time that we live in a like, world that people moves and stuff, why likely everyone is white? I mean, like, uh, so I think it's about the... Uh, yeah, I think women is a thing and it's important. I think it brings diversity and it's the easy ones because there are a lot of women, but the, it needs to be diversity in general. I think like the, it's moving fast and it, we, sit, we need to broaden the, the thing a bit. We still have time for it. <laughs> Just stuff I'm curious about. Um, do you have people coming in, like, do you feel like producer is a 
do you feel like game producers or could you also go into another industry and be a producer like do you have people who are who are movie producers and come in to become game producers and do you have people leaving for other media um, i don't know i'm curious about that yeah we do uh we have uh, our dialogue producers he used to work in uh, tv mm -hmm. series like yeah mm -hmm. um I mean, I think we could also apply our skills to any project manager role out mm. there in, mm. in big companies. Um, so in a way, we are, we are not tied to the gaming industry. It's just so much more fun making games. I worked in IKEA. I mean, I worked in video games, like uh, first as a programmer and then a producer for many years. And then I was done. I was like, that's for me for games. <laughs> I've done this since I started the, like out of university. And I live here in Malmo. And I was also tired of the commute and flying and whatnot. And I went Swedish and I went to IKEA, Swedish all the way. <laughs> and uh, um, because uh, IKEA actually has like 2,000 or 3,000 developers, they create a lot of software, actually. And uh, um, it was interesting. I learned a lot of things. But I also felt uh, it was very boring compared with games. After two years, I came back crying like, <laughs> to one of the companies I worked for, that was Ayu. Ayu was the first company I ever worked. And then uh, I knocked at their door like, uh, do you have anything for me by any chance? <laughs> because I need to leave this job. So the, the yes, we can go elsewhere, but actually games is pretty, pretty fun. So I mean, why would I? I tried it and at least, uh, yeah, it's very fun. No? <laughs> We still have uh, time maybe for one or two questions. Yes. Reach out on LinkedIn. Is is always uh, I think um, an opportunity or a way to go. Um, if you write me or anybody else, I think asking, can you tell me more about um, how you work or w what is your role as a producer? Um, how do you do that uh, at I/O? Then um, I'd be happy to share. So. And then again, I think, look at which studios are in your area. Where do you live uh, in your town? Um, do they have any events? Um, I feel like there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of events that you could attend uh, to mingle with the industry. But yes, second, the, the LinkedIn thing. I, I often actually reply yeah. to, to messages like that. Uh, I ignore outsourcing companies wanting to sell their things, mm -hmm. but uh, people writing, asking for a way into the industry mm -hmm. or my experiences, I, I reply to that. The, I'm, I'm a mentor in the IT universities, a university in Copenhagen, and we had a wrap-up uh, session, like actually two weeks ago, with the mentees, and then actually this question came up. One of the mentees talk about the events and they have this uh, Friday like a game bar or something in Copenhagen and that they feel that is the students here, then the people from the industry mm -hmm. here and there's is this awkward thing. And a lot of people answered. So this is actually not necessarily my opinion, but there was a discussion about it. And the conclusion was that it's actually awkward for everybody. <laughs> like the, 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 the students maybe feel awkward going to talk to the people, but the people like they are in the industry also feel awkward to go to talk to the students. So then everybody stays in their group because it's where the, who they know. So it's basically they don't know each other, right. but everybody's hoping to talk to each other <laughs> in a way. You need to do some speed dating or something. Exactly, like, like, because the, the ones in the industry feel bad saying, hey, I'm here, I'm going to give you knowledge. I mean, but the other ones don't go and say, hey, I make you a question. So then everybody's mm -hmm. staying in the corner, but everybody, when they are with a purpose, right? So the, the resolution there is that the, both parties need to, they are to break the ice and they mingle a bit more. And the, for people even that has been in the industry many years, those uh, events are also a bit awkward. It's for everyone. So like just they are to do it. I, I really wanted to attend this, uh, this year's uh, game jam in Copenhagen, but I could not because I had to travel back to Croatia. And I think that's a great example of very intense kind of event, 
but that gives you a lot back and that uh, gives you an opportunity to either join a team that is already, uh, you know, there. It, it may be even be people that you don't know, like programmers and a bunch of designers that you maybe know through someone else. And then you just ask if you can come there and uh, uh, or make your own team. Make your own team and make really bad game, but try to create it. And these networking events are a great thing, but also try to think out, out of the box. If, if you believe that you have something to offer to this industry, and if you think that, that your s skills will be valuable, start something on your own. Like no one is stopping you to open a group on Discord and connect with, uh, with uh, people that have the same passion. And I don't know, do your thing. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yes, another question. <laughs> we hire uh, specifically, for instance, for the mission team. We do so right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it's important that you have the right profile compared to what areas are you going to maintain, but that that being said, you can still move around different areas of production. So I'm not bound to do mission producing forever. I could go to Backbone at some point if I want to. <laughs> uh, but when we hire, we of course have a specific position in mind uh, and hire for that. It will also make it easier to align on the job expectations. Yeah. If there is a burning question, and don't hold back and ask it now. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I thank you so much for your openness and sharing your experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.